so just so you know, guys, I will be going through this talk pretty fast. It wasn't originally designed to be 30 minutes. So if I stop making sense, please wave frantically at me and I'll try my best to explain. Um, so the bit that nobody cares about, this is me. I'm not Don Smith, no matter what the um, schedule says. I'm Keith Lerman, that's my creative name on Twitter. Uh, I'm an Aberty graduate. They still let me on the premises though, so thank you. Um, I worked at an MSSP for the last six years. Uh, started off in the SOC with a large number of clients and a large number of blogs, and now I work within the IR team. And I go by the professional credence that as long as you can Google faster than your client can think up questions, you're good to go. So this talk's gonna be about credential theft. So first of all, it's the first priority for an attacker in post-exploitation. Why? Because often there's not that much use in the account that you land on first. You know, outside of things like web server exploits, and even then you still need to pivot. Uh, yeah, you enter at low privilege, you need high privilege to get actions on your objective. So why do you need them? First of all, lateral movement, that's the key. Um, attackers are going in to encrypt data, exfiltrate data, something to get money or the information that they want. That's not gonna be on the server that you land on most of the time. Um, privilege escalation, again, actions and objectives. Being an admin is always good. So if you can steal the credentials of an existing admin, that'll help you get to where you want to be. And the one that's talked about less is persistence. You know, if you do get detected and they kick you off the infrastructure, what better persistence mechanism is there than having a username and password that you can just log back into? Um, so why don't you just make a new account? Well, you need access to do this first. So you need to steal credentials to create the account in the first place. And also account creations tend to be tracked a little more stringently than um, account usage simply because there are a lot less account creations and group additions than there are um, logins and login failures. So we'll split the accounts into two categories here. First of all, you have local accounts. Um, these are the accounts that are stored locally on a machine for use with one machine, ostensibly. I say ostensibly because if you have like a golden Windows image that you're pushing to all of your laptops, and you have a local account on every single image, it's gonna have the same password. It might as well be a domain account at that point. Um, the details are stored locally in the registry. There's a database um, called the Security Account Manager, also known as the SAM Hive. It's always gonna be written as SAM on this. Um, it's a hash-based authentication. So the actual passwords aren't stored in Windows. It's only hashes. Um, before the NT kernel, which I think was 1993, they were stored as LM. I'm not gonna go into the details on LM and NTLM and how they are created, as you know, that would add another 15, 30 minutes onto the end of this talk. Um, you also have some two built-in accounts in almost all the Windows operating systems. You've got the administrator account, which has you know, full control of local resources and accounts and you have the guest account. I have lost my mouse. Oh, well. Yeah. This is stuff about the NTLM hash. I'm just gonna skip through them. Um, one important fact that will come up is that the NTLM hashes are not salted. Um, that might sound not great for hash-based authentication, but if you think about it, if you, salt, uh, if you salt input before you hash it, you have to store the salt somewhere. If you're storing the salt in a local database, there's no added security because the attacker has access to the salt as well as the hash they're trying to crack. Um, so the user input, when you type your um, password into the login screen, that is converted to an NTLM hash, which, um, the winlog on XA and lsas.exe processes will compare that hash you've inputted to the hash that's in the SAM database. If they're the same, that means what you put in the login screen is the password and it lets you in. Um, other hashes do exist for local accounts. 
um, TSPKG, WDigest, Live SSD. I'm going to go into what they are in a second. They're mostly for a single sign on for other protocols. Uh, the other one's remote accounts. Um, are you all familiar with Active Directory? There's a lot of nods, so I won't go into detail on that. Um, the one detail to know about Active Directory that is important is that you have the domain controller, which is a server that contains the hashes of all of the accounts in the domain, all of the remote accounts. When you are trying to um, access them, it's usually the Kerberos protocol that speaks to the domain controller to say, is this person who they say they are and have they got the password for that account? Um, sometimes it will default to NTLM based hash authentication, even though it's um, remote with a domain controller. That is when the server isn't in a domain, it will default to the hash. And um, when it connects to a server using an IP address and reverse DNS is unavailable, the Kerberos protocol needs to know the host name of the thing it's speaking to. If it can't find that, it just uses the um, hash. Um, for interactive, so if I'm typing the password in on the computer itself, or if I'm doing an RDP, the hash is still loaded into LSAS, even when it's remote. Um, I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time. So the ntds.dip file is for the remote accounts. This is the file that's stored on the domain controller that contains all of the um, user and the user credential for the entire domain. So that's all your user accounts, your admin accounts, your service accounts, and even the computer accounts for each individual machine. All those details are stored in this one database on your domain controller. So it's really the keys to the kingdom. Um, it's stored in C slash Windows slash NTDS. Um, and it is locked and protected and it is encrypted with a RC4 encryption key named syskey. So just, I went over that quickly. So just as a summary of the different places hashes can be found, you've got the SAM registry hive for local accounts. You have the um, security cache, which was the one that I skipped over. That's for um, previously logged in users. And you have the ntds.dit on the domain controller for all your remote accounts. You also have the system registry hive, which contains the syskey value that's encrypting the SAM registry hive and encrypting the NTDS file. And you also have LSAS. I mentioned this process earlier. It's the bit that's comparing your hash against the hash in the database. It's the one that's making sure you put the right thing in which means that it has interesting things in memory. Um, I'll get onto more details on LSAS in a second. So how do I retrieve hashes from the SAM database? Um, so they are partially encrypted with syskey value. So you need to retrieve the syskey value before you can retrieve the hashes. Uh, there is a built-in Windows executable named reg. This is just a uh, very basic tool that allows you to query and edit the registry. So, um, is that plenty big for everyone? Because there's a few pictures like this. This is output from an EDR. So we have um, a little bit of reconnaissance from an attacker. This is them landing on a machine for the first time. They do a host name to work out what the host they've landed on is. They do net user to work out who they are, who they're logged in as at the moment. And then they go straight into saving the SAM file using reg, and then they save the system file. And then most likely what they did next was after taking those offline onto their own machines, use a tool like uh, PW dump, password dump, put in the system hive, put in the SAM hive you've um, exfiltrated, and it decrypts the hashes. So this is the NTLM hash for the account administrator. Um, the second big long string is the LM hash. 
Uh, you'll note that it's the same for everyone. That's because LM was deprecated in 1993, but because Microsoft refuses to deal with backwards compatibility, it sticks a blank value in for the LM hash for everyone. So it's there, but it's not usable. Um, cached credentials, I've got too many slides on this. So, so I'll go over it. The cached credentials, if I go to my mom's house with my work laptop and I log in, I don't have an internet connection, so it can't reach out to the domain controller of my company, but it still allows me in. That's because for every domain user that logs into a computer, it caches the credentials of the last 10 users who logged into a machine. And that's so if you don't have internet, you can still access your computer, even if you can't reach the domain, um, which is really, when you think about it, an incredibly large number of accounts, because if you think about your work laptop, how many people log into that? How many accounts log into that? You, the IT guy who set it up, and maybe one or two help desk people. So those, those credentials are in forever. And if they're help desk, most likely they've got high levels of privilege. So, um, yes, when you're um, dumping those hashes, they are very similar to um, dumping the SAM. They're also encrypted with syskey, um, but they're in the security hive instead. So very much like the last tool, you give it the system hive you've exfiltrated, then you give it the security hive it's exfiltrated, and it gives you um, hashes. These are not NTLM hashes, they're a different type of hash. There's not actually that much use for them other than brute forcing to try and get a plain text password back. You can use them for some of the interesting techniques you can use NTLM hashes for. And how would you pull ntds.dit? So I mentioned it's encrypted with syskey, but it's also a locked and protected file because it's the most important thing in Active Directory. So you need to dump the SAM and the system hives to decrypt the NTDS file. So, but I've already shown how that easy that is for the other things. Um, but since it's locked, you can't copy that file. And since it's protected, you can't read that. You can't take a copy of it and read that. Um, it's the Windows Security API that's protecting it, saying it's locked, it's in use, and also it's protected, you can access it. But if you have a malicious driver, the driver doesn't use the API. It's the level below APIs. So it completely skips all of the, um, completely skips all of the protections. Uh, that's what PowerSploit and a number of other post-exploitation frameworks use. I believe Metasploit has another one. But that isn't as popular as NTDS util, because with every single good security protection, there's about a 50% chance Microsoft have written their own tool to bypass that security protection. So this is a built-in sysadmin tool that can directly access the NTTS dit file. And the last one is volume shadows. So you can use the volume shadow tool to create a backup of the system image. So if you've got a protected um, file, NTTS, if you take a backup, why not access the copy of it in the backup instead? So here's another telemetry. This is um, another example of an actor landing on a host. They are running a batch script that does NTDS util, exfiltrates the NTDS file as C Windows Web Temp. And then they can exfiltrate that and that's all of your domain credentials gone. And this is an example of an attacker who's created a volume shadow copy. And you're just taking the ntds.dit file directly out of the copy because there's no protections on it anymore. Um, and LSAS. This is probably one of the most common credential theft techniques these days, mainly because of the prevalence of Minicats, which is the main tool that focuses on LSAS. So it's part of the internal interface with SAM and um, the hashes and Kerberos tickets tend to end up in the memory of the process. So dump the memory process, take that memory dump offline, 
crack the hashes or retrieve the hashes. Um, there are a lot of tools. Proc dumps the most common. The proc dump is a tool from the sys internal suites, which was a big load of sysadmin tools created by a third party engineer who was so good at it that Microsoft then hired him and took the tools internally. Very simple, proc dump, LSAS exe, outputting as LSAS.dump. Attacker then takes the dump file offline, pulls the hashes out of it. Um, there are other techniques that have come up because people have started cottoning on to proc dump and these tools. Comservices.dll is a um, DLL containing functions for com services. It's a built-in um, Microsoft file. It's a signed library. It's in system 32 for everyone. In traditional Microsoft fashion, it's completely undocumented. So there just happens to be a live uh, function in it called mini dump where you give it a process ID and it dumps all of the memory of that. So it's entire, you don't need to download any additional tools. You've got all the functionality in it. Um, so you get, you've got a PowerShell script here that gets the process of um, LSAS, process ID, and just outputs it in and saves it as a dump. Um, there's an, another one that is beginning to rise in um, popularity as well. Uh, create dump.exe, which is a executable within .NET, which is also in every single um, Windows instance these days. There's, there's, just, there's just a lot of undocumented stuff floating around in Windows, and you know, five years after it shows up, someone will eventually realize this is the perfect thing for attacking Windows, and they built it themselves. Um, but if you don't want to dump the process and uh, dump the memory and then pull it out, there are ways to read the memory live from the process. Um, this is what Mimikatz does and invoke Mimikatz. And then there's a couple of older tools, Windows Credential Editor and pwdump6. Mimikatz got too good and kind of squeezed out all of the others. So I don't really see many of the others. Um, so at the ring three level, um, the SE debug privilege, if you are an admin, you can grant to yourself. This allows you to, it's, it's designed for debugging. It essentially allows you to open up a process and dig through the memory of it. Um, so if you have the ability to do that in LSAS, you don't need to dump the memory. You already have the access. At a ring zero level, malicious driver does the exact same thing. It's below all the protection levels. You can just access the memory directly. Um, so this is an example of the ring three stuff. We have a run DLL32 that is opening the LSAS process and writing, writes a new thread and puts it into the LSAS process and exfiltrates the credentials. And this one led, you'll notice that's 0208, 1815. And then 0209, so that's 25 hours later, we have comps6.txt, which is a list of all of their computers, the admin username and the password they've pulled out, and r.exe, which is Ryuk. So good, goodbye to me. Um, yes, so some authentication types, some of the older ones and less well-known ones do Encrypt, I can't see what that says. Five, Five. okay. Um, so you've got double digest, which is the important one. Um, this was for LDAP authentication in server 2003. It's really like weakly encrypted within LSAS. So you can basically pull the plain text password out of the memory of LSAS. Um, a patch in 2017 removed clear text passwords from all but W digest. Uh, but the same patch introduced a registry key that allows you to switch it back on. So attackers just go in and change the registry value. What that means is then every logon afterwards has the plain text stored in LSAS. Um, that's just a picture. If it's red, that means data is stored within LSAS. If it's green, that means no data is in memory. I'm afraid I can't remember who I stole this from, so if they're watching, I'm sorry. So we have a hash. 
We have the hashes, we don't have the clear text passwords. What are we gonna do with them? There's a huge load of hash cracking tools. John the Ripper, Hashcat, Cain Enable, spanning many, many years. Um, you can do mostly rainbow table-based cracking because it's not salted hash. Um, but if neither computer has the password and you're verifying the hash at the far end, we already have the hash. So why do we need the plain text password? So if you are logging in remotely using NTLM authentication, that is stored as a token because you only want to put your password in once. You don't have to give the password every single time you send it a new command. So every authenticated process on that remote system is assigned to a token. That token contains the username and the hash, and that's how it's authenticating it. So all you need to do is edit the token you're sending and stick in the hash of the, the hash of the user you've just stolen. And th there we go, you've got a valid token. Um, yeah, so this is Mimikatz being given a hash, logging in as a user in a domain. Tokens, yes, we've just gone over this. Every log on, proce every log on and process gets a security token. It describes the privileges and security concepts for the account that's running, as I just explained. Now, impersonate and delegate tokens allow for the single sign-on. Um, so using the impersonate privilege allows you to essentially run processes as other users, and delegate does the same thing, but over network resources, so not just on a local account. Um, now the tokens only exist during a logon session. So these tokens can be extracted as soon as you've got the SE impersonate privilege. So if you have local admin permissions, you can just sit on the host, wait for a domain admin to log on and just take their token and use it yourself. Um, there's an example. So tickets, Kerberos, a uh, whirlwind tour of Kerberos. You send a request to the domain controller saying, I want access to something. The domain controller verifies the credentials of the account you've sent saying, does this account exist? If yes, it um, sends a ticket granting ticket, TGT, back that is encrypted with the hash of the um, user you want. It creates a secret key using the hash. Now, when you've got this ticket granting ticket that's encrypted, you, your user input, you put your password in, that gets turned into a secret key as well. And if you put in the right password, then the keys are the same. It will be able to decrypt the tickets. And yeah, from there, once you have a decrypted ticket, you can verify with the domain controller that you actually have permissions to access the service. If you do, it sends back the session token and you go to your service and you're authenticated. Now this ticket granting ticket lives for 10 hours by default. Um, this is stored within the LSAS process memory and can be stolen the same way that the hashes are. It lives for 10 hours by default because you don't want someone to have access to your service forever, but you also don't want to have to spam the domain controller every single time they try and access it. So the pass the ticket is much the same as pass the hash. If you can, if you can pull the tickets out of LSAS memory, you're already pre-authenticated as that user for 10 minutes, 10 hours. You can just use it. Um, it allows you to pose as only one user for a limited time for, the, for that 10 hour period. And if you stole it seven hours in, you've only got three hours to play with. We, we can do better than that. So there's a thing called Kerberos thing. Uh, an idea behind Windows is that basically any action in Windows can be mapped back to an account, whether that's a user account, whether that's an account for the actual machine. Every service that's running is mapped to a service account, etc. So say you have like Office 365 automations. If you've got scripts, there might be a service account called Office 365 automations. So any user can request any service. Yeah. Um, 
Any user can request any service. The ticket that comes back has a non-salted password hash for the service account. So you can just take that out of the ticket, take it offline, and crack the password for any service. Um, and you can request the weaker cipher, so it makes it even easier. Now, since any action maps to a service count, KBRTGT is the service that creates the tickets. So you can request the unsalted password hash from the ticket granting ticket account, brute the force of the password, and then you can create tickets at leisure. You can grant it any time you want. You were stuck at 10 hours before. You can just create one for 20 years now, and nothing cares. You're not, you're, you're not past expiry date, therefore it's fine. Um, XP was bad. There was a lot of flaws. Windows 7 got a little bit better. They added user access control, so admins aren't running as admins by default. Uh, Windows 8 was really good, even if it didn't do anything else right. So single sign-on was no longer cached in LSAS. It, you can still switch it on. Uh, your local accounts are restricted from network logons, so you can't really pass the hash with the local accounts you've created. And protected processes, LSAS is now protected, so you need to be signed code to inject into it, and only other pro protected processes can attach the debugger. Uh, they also added a security group called Domain Protected Users, which bans weak authentication, credentials never cached, tokens cannot be delegated, um, and your hashes aren't cached. And your Kerberos ticket is restricted to four hours, and you can't give it the weak ciphers for Kerberos thing. Um, Windows 10 did Credential Guard, where LSAS was essentially split into LSAS and LSAT ISO. This is using virtualization to give an extra level of protection. Really, it comes down to basic hygiene. Don't interactively log into user laptops as domain admin because that's caching credentials. If you're a help desk and you really need to, use PowerShell administration because it doesn't send the credentials over to be cached. Um, on that subject, a policy of lowest required privilege. It, you're, you're only using Excel, Chrome, and Outlook. You don't need local admin on your machine. Why are you checking your, ad, your emails as an admin anyway? Um, RDP connections, terminate them when you're finished. Don't just click close because you're still logged in at that point, which means your tokens are still on the machine. If you're a help desk and you're RDPing into people's machines, don't leave your account running on all of these um, laptops. Long passwords on your service accounts, and it might be worth changing them regularly. And while it's easier said than done, monitor for anomalous activity. If one user suddenly starts requesting a lot of TGTs, chances are, the attempt at curb roasting going on. Um, there are a lot of times a workstation will log into a server. There aren't very many cases where a laptop will log into another laptop. So another thing to keep an eye out on. And your domain controller needs monitoring. If you only have a limited amount of licenses on an EDR or something, that's your crown jewels. Keep it protected. Um, we don't have any time because it's the next keynote. So no questions. I'm afraid I won't be in the pub either, so I'll go back to the start to show you the... Yeah. <laughs> Keith Lermont is my Twitter name, so you can send me a message on there if you have questions.